Good evening and welcome to this evening's creativity conversation with Geraldine Higgins, Natasha Trethaway, and Fintan O'Toole. This is the third and final lecture in the renowned Richard Elman Lectures in Modern Literature at Emory University, and I am so glad that you could all join us this evening. I'm Jennifer King, and I serve as the director of the Rose Library, and it is a special privilege to welcome you tonight. The Richard Elman Lectures in Modern Literature have played a significant role in establishing the Rose Library as one of the best known and most heavily used poetry and literature libraries in the world. Those of you who were here last night heard Ron Schuhard tell the story of Emory University's invitation to Seamus Heaney in 1988 to give the inaugural Elman Lecture. His lectures, later published in The Place of Writing, took place over several days, days of Southern hospitality, celebratory meals, conversations with students, quite like this week's visit with Natasha and Finton. Enriching our campus with conversations and insights that forever inspire and change us. The deepening of the friendship between Emory University and Seamus Heaney led eventually to Seamus's decision in 2003, 15 years later, to place a portion of his papers at Emory. That was a watershed moment, helping to usher the decision by 30, almost 30 Irish writers to do the same. In a similar fashion, over the last 40 years, American writers, including Natasha Trethaway, Tracy K. Smith, Kevin Young, Major Jackson, Richard Blanco, Lucille Clifton, Nathaniel Mackey, Alice Walker, to name but a few, have made the same decision. And it's because Emory and Rose Library are dedicated to the preservation of memory. In addition to poetry and literature, the Rose Library proudly preserves and documents political, social, and cultural movements, African-American history and culture, rare books, university archives, and oral history. Holding together the papers and records of more than 2,000 individuals and organizations. And if these materials were lined up box to box, it would be more than four miles of archival materials. So I've been struck as the director of the Rose Library over these last couple of days by how the mission of the archive feels to me very aligned with the mission of the writer. And if you'll bear with me for a moment, Natasha Trethaway's lecture on Sunday was quite honestly the most beautiful lecture I've heard in my life. And in it, I heard affirmation of Natasha's relevance. And Fenton, your lecture last night about Seamus Heaney had the same effect on me. As you established for me, a new understanding and affirmation of Seamus Heaney's relevance. And the way in your your writing affirms relevance and is connected, I think, to the expression I've often heard during the last many years at Emory University that the Rose Library is Emory's crown jewel. Have you guys heard that expression before? <laughs> I'm not wearing a crown. I'm not wearing jewels. And so I've been giving that one some thought. And I don't think it's really about crowns. I don't think it's really about jewels. I think it's more about Emory's support of relevance and affirmation. Um, our university celebrates writers, writers who capture the magical light of our lives with words on a page, words like Natasha's phrase, which I'm going to savor for a long time, persimmon, mimosa, and pecan trees. I feel like those are the trees of my childhood. These are phrases like Fenton's yesterday, um, to be deeply engaged in the texture of their time. Phrases, fragments, moments, conversations, and ultimately lives that are affirmed and made relevant when they're gathered together in a magical way, like words on a page. Words gently written or furiously written, but written on a page, preserved, savored like jewels, if you will, and preserved by Emery's archivists. 
and made relevant through exhibitions like the exhibition upstairs, Listen Now Again, curated by Geraldine Higgins and on loan from the National Library of Ireland, to the Crossroads exhibition currently on display in Woodruff Library featuring the art and archives of artists Benny Andrews, Flannery O'Connor, and Alice Walker through our instruction and research services, through lectures like these, because this evening's creativity conversation is about affirmation and relevance, in my view. So I promise to wrap up in a second, but before I do, I want to acknowledge the Muscogee Creek people who lived, worked, produced knowledge on, and nurtured the land where we stand today. And I want to now introduce my colleague, Carla Freeman, who is the creativity, oh, excuse me, she is the director of the Fox Center for Humanistic Inquiry. And I feel like it's so perfect that the Elman lectures at this stage and its history at this university that celebrates the humanities, affirms the relevance of humanities. The lecture series is now under Carla's fantastic leadership. Um, Carla serves in addition to um, director of the Fox Center as Goodrich White Professor of Women's, Gender, and Sexuality Studies, and importantly, to note, served from 2014 to 2023 as Interim Dean of Emory College of Arts and Sciences, Executive Associate Dean, as well as Dean of the Faculty, Carla. Thank you, Jennifer. Wow, those lights are bright. I was watching Fenton yesterday do this, and now I understand why. Good evening, and welcome back to the Schwartz Center for the third and final gathering of the 2024 Richard Elman Lectures with Natasha Trethaway and Fenton O'Toole. Thanks to Ron Schuhard yesterday, you got a brief history of the Elman Lectures, and I couldn't be more delighted to relaunch the signature Emory tradition in celebration of literature, poetry, creative expression, and the life of the mind. Spanning three days of lectures, receptions, informal conversations, seminars, and classroom visits, these are more than your typical literary festival or university lecture series. Not only because we work our visitors very hard, but because over these few intense days, our community comes together over ideas and artistry. I've heard so many people in these last couple of days say that they were seeing people they hadn't laid eyes on since before COVID, and what a treat this is. Living in these tense and violent times makes writing and deep reflection all the more urgent, and the pleasure of these occasions all the more intense. So thank you for coming. In addition to celebrating great writers and poets, the Elman Lectures are known to forge collaborations and genuine friendships that endure far beyond three days. Seamus Heaney's Elman visits in the 80s seeded deep personal and institutional relationships that live on even a decade past his death. Salman Rushdie so enjoyed his Elman visit that he joined the Emory faculty. He trained graduate students, collaborated, and from what I recall, dined frequently with our faculty and entrusted our Rose Library with his archive. For Natasha Trethaway, the Elman invitation is a homecoming for one we like to think we raised up, a native daughter and friend for whom Emory will always offer safe harbor. Fintan O'Toole's Elman Lecture also marks a 10-year anniversary visit when he came to launch the Seamus Heaney exhibition, The Music of What Light, of, of What, sorry, The Music of What Happens. Fintan, I hope we too can tempt you into an equally enduring relationship. By now, you are intimately familiar with the biographies of our wonderful speakers and our fabulous faculty director of the Elman Lectures, Geraldine Higgins. So I'm going to jump right into the frame of this final gathering and what we intend with a creativity conversation, a genre first introduced here by Rosemary McGee. 
This third day offers an opportunity to enjoy a somewhat looser structure, an unscripted and creative conversation, to probe what it means to write a life, why and how and to what ends. We've enjoyed two days of lectures, beautiful and poetic renderings of the writer's work, the elisions and gaps, and the ruptures and forces, domestic and and national violence, that compel such writing. How, often over many years, the process unfolds, often to unpredictable ends. Natasha Trethewey told us she, quote, turned to literature for the way it enables us to momentarily suspend time, to live in the moment of a story unfolding, or within the lyric articulation of the self, both for the writer and the reader. And I have to share with you a message I received Sunday night after Natasha's lecture from a member of the audience, a scientist and a musician, who described Natasha's talk as having, and I quote, the same effect as going to a particularly moving concert. Partly what and partly how, but time, always the toughest critic, just melted away. Wow, Carla, unquote. I hope you are allowing your own minds to linger over the lectures, the reverberations of Heaney, and the reflections on a writer's life, on writing a life one's own life or another's, the prisms one life casts upon larger themes, as Trethaway described in The House of Being, personal and public histories, erasure and memorialization, vernacular and classical traditions. Both Trethaway and O'Toole plumb the role of memory and erasure, the forgetting for Trethaway and the blank spots at the heart of, bi- of the biographical project for O'Toole required to afford memory and enhance illumination. In writing a life, they are at turns poet, memoirist, biographer, historian, investigative journalist, critic, psychoanalyst, raconteur. Today's event is a conversation, and a conversation is its own form of the creative process, unscripted, impromptu, potentially more emotionally charged, moving in unexpected directions and onto unanticipated terrain. To steer this journey, I'm delighted to turn the helm over to Geraldine Higgins, and um, I invite you to buckle up and enjoy. Hello, everyone. Well, I hope we can deliver on that wonderful introduction um, uh, by Carla and uh, Jennifer. They have really uh, set us up for some exciting um, conversation this, uh, this afternoon. And it has been my huge thrill to spend the last three days with these two wonderful speakers and to be able to have many informal conversations as well as the one that we're um, having right now. Um, so I thought we dive right in and think about the theme of writing lives, um, which forms the the topic of this year's um, Almond Lectures. And one of the quotes that we uh, used when we were um, putting the theme together or thought about was one from Seamus Heaney. And he, in writing one of his early essays, um, wrote this down. He said, how should a poet properly live and write? What is his relationship to his own voice his own place, his literary heritage, and his contemporary world. Um, And I suppose, like all writers, he spent a lifetime figuring that out. (laughs) But I'm going to turn, I suppose, um, I'm first to you, Natasha, and to ask you to uh, talk to us about the title of your memoir and the ways in which it opened up um, the space for you to write about your mother. Oh, thanks for that question, Geraldine. Um, You know, I have to Before I say something about it, it just allows me to, for a moment, um, remember a beloved colleague, Lena Williams, who um, was the kind of person that I could sit down at lunch with and talk about titles I was thinking of. And she always knew exactly the right one. Uh, She circled a word, the words that I had written on a menu um, and tore them off 
and that was Native Guard. With Memorial Drive, I sat down with her and I started telling her all of these things that I was thinking of, really hiding Memorial Drive because I didn't want to say that one because I thought it was so pedestrian. And at the very, she listened patiently to all the other ones and then I sort of threw that one out and she said, that's the one. And of course, the moment I thought about it, I mean, it was a title not unlike Native Guard for me because it had both literal and figurative possibilities. Quite literally, my mother was killed and died on Memorial Drive. Um, but also, that idea has been the thing that has driven me. The desire to remember, to memorialize, is the thing that drives me as a writer. You could talk about your uh, title as well, and you have a, a, a different word for memoir. And we've, we've talked a bit about the difference between memoir, biography, and all of the other uh, ways we can think about it. So um, Natasha's title is superb, like everything um, that she writes, and it it's captures exactly what it is she wants to do. Mine is a complete failure <laughs> because <laughs> it's, it's really clever. I was really pleased with myself when I came up with it. And it doesn't work anywhere else except Ireland. <laughs> <laughs> so, and I didn't know this. Um, so the, the title of the book I did is called We Don't Know Ourselves. And it was meant to be nicely ambiguous, you know, which is, so the literal, you know, the literal meaning about, um, and so the book is kind of structured around this idea of how a society can both know and not know things at the same time. So, you know, that bit kind of works because every society does that and, and, and certainly America does. Um, but the, the, the pun that I was very pleased with, right, was that in Ireland, and it turns out nowhere else, <laughs> we say, if you get a new lawnmower, you know, and your neighbor says, how's the new lawnmower? You say, we don't know ourselves since we got the new lawnmower. You know, it's just fantastic. And it was sort of meant to have that sort of ironic thing of because Ireland's become rich, right? And, you know, and it's a story I'm telling of this place that was very backward, economically very poor, um, which has found itself as probably the most globalized economy in the world. And, uh, and, you know, so it was meant to have that kind of double thing going. Um, so, um, I'm afraid it's just a, it turned out to be just a statement about my own parochialism and thinking that everybody else <laughs> thought of that phrase the same way that I did. But the, the thing actually that was more important for me was the subtitle, which, mm -hmm. which was this, um, personal history. And I was really reluctant to use that because it's so arrogant, you know, putting the personal and historical together. But I mean, Natasha spoke so beautifully about this. And, but, but in a way that is what we, try to do as writers, you know, to, 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 um, somehow map that terrain where you, your own experience, your own life, um, mirrors, uh, is shaped by, and therefore also might be a route into the big public history that's going on. Right. Right. As I said to you the other day, I love your subtitle. I love <laughs> personal history because I'm a little bit skeptical about the idea of memoir, or at least, you yeah. know, what contemporary memoir was or people's expectation of it. But for all the reasons you described, I love personal history. Yeah. Well, memoir, though, and memory and return are so vital to the way both of you write. And um, I suppose one of the things that's fascinating about both these books is the way they are structured and the way you lead us into thinking about the issues that you're dealing with. And Natasha, I, I want to read the two epigraphs that um, frame Memorial Drive. Um, and they're both beautiful. John Banville, the past beats inside me like a second heart. And Martin Buber's all journeys have secret destinations of which the traveller is unaware. So it, it strikes me that these epigraphs really open up this story of your past rather than summing it up the way an epitaph uh, would do. Yes. Um, you know, they, they, aff they offered for me a, a guide throughout the whole um, book as well. You know, because there is, you know, I am trying to work with not only that idea of being driven by something, but the journey of trying to recollect uh, the past, trying to recollect a life 
when there are so many moments that one could choose to narrate it and choosing certain ones uh, has everything to do with, you know, being on that journey, but not knowing where you're ended up. Um, there are also uh, several times in the book that um, I'm actually taking drives or being driven. Um, and the final page of the memoir, uh, I think is, you know, this is how one hopes that readers will sort of pay attention to epigraphs and then where they end up. On that very last page is a, a recollection of uh, the year before I was old enough to drive and how um, my mother would let me uh, take the steering wheel on long stretches of empty highway. And in order to do that, I'd have to lean over like this um, in front of her and so that part of me was over her chest. And I could feel her heart, you know, and I end with I could feel her heart beating against me as if I had not one but two. And so it, it really is trying to capture both the idea of on these drives, how I think about her and that journey and that moment in it, but also those two hearts and that past that beats inside me. So beautiful and again, gives us another insight into Memorial Drive, the, the, the drive. Um, and I think I also, I think we're all aware when Natasha speaks and when she spoke in her lecture um, uh, on uh, on the first day of the Almond Lectures, just how much she's writing as a poet always, even when she's writing prose. Um, and I think both these genres, the prose and the poetry, are are vessels to contain things. They're ways, as she said, of putting order onto chaos. Um, but I just wondered where, how aware you were and how, how difficult it was to switch between prose and poetry, how you did that. You know, it really didn't feel that I was doing something much differently than I do in writing a collection of poetry. Because I am always thinking about the whole collection, you know, what uh, supposedly an, in an ap apocryphal story, Robert Frost called the 25th poem. So, you know, a collection of poems uh, is, you know, made up of the individual poems, but the whole thing is that 25th poem. Mm -hmm. And so writing Memorial Drive was right, it was made up of a series of vignettes that um, are woven together with the kinds of motifs and, I hope, musicality of a poem, but that the whole thing is supposed to be like a 25th poem. Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah, yeah. And Fintan, you are writing the biography of a poet, so, <laughs> and I think we were all struck by how uh, important poetry was to, in your thinking about biography. A lot of your definitions came from the great poets, Shakespeare, Wordsworth, and of course, Yeats. And I want to ask both of you about Yeats. Um, but how do you navigate the role of the biographer um, uh, when you're writing about a poet? So, you know, it's a, it's a very different process to what you've done, um, you know, because you're, you're involved so much in, in um, dealing with trauma, dealing with, with stuff that's so profoundly personal. Um, and I'm looking in from the outside at, at really a life that is not traumatic. Uh, you know, Seamus Heaney's life was not traumatic. Um, you know, it's, it's, uh, pretty nice to win the Nobel Prize. And, <laughs> and, you know, he was, he was loved and he, you know, he was a wonderful, um, human being and he, he had a benign presence, um, everywhere he went. Um, and so it's, it's a very different process in that sense. And, um, you can you can piece together the career and you can tell the story. I hope with with interest, um, I, but then you're always looking for what are the darknesses. You know, nobody really. We all think we like happy stories, and but they get very boring. <laughs> you know, it's just you know he was a he was a lovely man. He was a great guy. He wrote great poems and he won the Nobel Prize. It's not you know it's not really that interesting in a, in a funny sort of way. So what you're always looking for are are those those tensions, those contradictions, those ambiguities, those difficulties, um, and in his case, a lot of them are provided by the political context. Mm -hmm. So, um, one of the reasons I was very interested in in writing the biography, um, I, I've, I've written biographies before, but mostly 18th century stuff, which is great because 
everybody is dead and nobody really cares, <laughs> you know, and, and, and the, the stakes are not that high. Mm-hmm. Whereas the stakes for Heaney were the stakes of language in a condition of conflict that was itself partly driven by bad language. What's bad politics? Bad politics is cliche. You know, it's sloganeering. It's, it's the dehumanizing language that's, that gets sort of dead, but can actually also be murderous, mm-hmm. you know. And I think he was deeply conscious of that. And one of the dramas of his life is trying to think, you know, as a very responsible person and a person who you know, really felt he, he, he had a burden to try and do some good, what good can I do as a poet? Mm-hmm. And, and ultimately, the faith is that <clears throat> actually what we can do as poets is um, keep language supple and open and ambiguous and capable of doing something that the politicians don't do mm-hmm. in the hope that maybe reality will want that ambiguity at some point, will want that subtlety at some point, may not want to listen to it now. Mm-hmm. And this is what happens in Ireland. I mean, it is an extraordinary thing that um, if you look at the peace agreement that was made in 1998, how could you make a peace agreement? Everybody knew exactly what its content was, but it had never worked before. Mm-hmm. And it never worked before because nobody was able to put it in a language that could be heard slightly differently by two sides. Mm-hmm. You, you needed sentences that, frankly, Protestant unionists could read in one way and Catholic nationalists could read in a slightly different way. Mm-hmm. And everybody could then feel that they were not being defeated, you know, that it was okay. And that's poetry. I mean, that's, mm-hmm. that's the ambiguity, the suppleness. You know, if, if you read Natasha's, and I think it, what's so extraordinary about her work is the way the prose is poetic, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, but but it, it, it has that fluency, that ambiguity, that openness, which is what we crave. And I think what, what, what Heaney ultimately does is, is keep that space open so that the language can be used in that way. And it has a very profound consequence. Poetry, in that sense, is not marginal. It's not an entertainment off on the side. It's not obscure. You know, it actually matters because language matters. Well, that's a wonderful I'd, segue to well, you, yes. Actually, I, I'd like to linger for a moment on the idea of trauma. Um, because it seems to me that... Um, I obviously, like Heaney, am also interested in traumas that are national, not simply personal. Um, Memorial Drive is really about becoming a writer. Um, it's not about a traumatic life. I experienced a trauma in my life, yeah. but I don't have a traumatic life. And when you said, I, I was thinking about this when you said, you know, he didn't have a traumatic life. I mean, he won the Nobel Prize and, you know, yada, yada, all of that is great. I remember this has happened to me so many times uh, doing a, a book club or something. And some very well-meaning person would say, oh, I would not want to have your life. <laughs> and I say, really? You wouldn't want my life? Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I don't know what your life is like, sweetheart, but I don't know. But anyway, it's, I, I don't think of my life as a traumatic life. And I think in some ways, if we label a life like that, then we don't see what resilience is about, what joy is about, what language can help us do, which is to triumph over all of those things yes. you just described. But it did make me want to ask too, about the traumas that each of us on personal levels experience. Who in this room has not had some experience of trauma, of losing something that is traumatic? I think of the last line of this poem. What is it? A four-foot box, a box for every year. A foot for every year. A foot for every year, Mm -hmm. which is, I wondered, I mean, where does that... Uh, recreation of that trauma in that Heaney poem come from? Yeah, you know, um, I, I mean, you're absolutely right about that, of course, that, that um, you know, how do we define trauma? You know, do we, do we see it as something that's very 
extreme and 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 can be named and and pinpointed, or is it part of the human condition? That <laughs> of course is part of the human condition, isn't it? And, and of course, it's it's. Um, I, I don't. I, I think all life writing mm-hmm. is a form of mourning. Mm-hmm. You know, it's it's very connected to. Um, so even you know, in my own bland stuff, to, you know, I was writing my own book, but. I couldn't have written that book until my parents were dead, you know. Mm-hmm. And it's a sort of recapitulation of their lives and how they lived through me, and you know, all those kind of things. And the stories in the book are are, are written, and off, a lot of them are about them. And it's our way of dealing with death, isn't it? And and Heaney is extraordinary because from the very beginning, I mean, from the time he's in his early twenties, poems are haunted by death. Um, and, and clearly the, the death of his young brother, Christopher, you know, who was just four and he was, um, the, the bus arrived across the road and he ran over to, to try to meet the bus, you know, and, um, a car came and hit him. So right in front of the house, he was killed and Seamus was at school. He was away. And so he describes beautifully this thing of getting the news, you know, being taken to the, principal's office and having to come back. Um, and, and of course, these things never go away, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, but, 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 but then you have at every stage, even in the most joyous poems, there's a poem, um, which I encountered here, which is, which is set here. Um, and it's about looking at Haley's Comet. He was here for Haley's Comet and he was taken up to the tower. Of uh, the president's um, house, and he's looking at Haley's comet, you know. And what is it? It's it's death suddenly, you know. <laughs> I mean, it's and it doesn't make the poem miserable or take away the joyfulness of it. But there's this pressure all the time. And uh, you know, I was talking in my talk last night about this passing through, mm-hmm. and passing through is life. You know, we we, we mm-hmm. passed through it. We we don't we can't stop it. You know, we can't stop it moving, and we can't stop it. Just that clock ticking all the time. And trauma is the wound. Yeah. Yeah. And as Rumi wrote, the wound is the place where the light enters you. Yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. And that that's also incredible when you do that in your memoir, where you slow down time and you take us through these moments, but you also in some way take care to use language to set up the ways in which we can appro- approach these in- extraordinary, um, difficult moments, not just... Um, you know, the the trauma that everyone will face death, we'll all die, everyone we love will die. But we talked a little bit about how difficult it is to say that and how difficult it is to approach that in, in writing. The reluctance to, I think we were talking about students saying, you know, why are you bringing us down by, <laughs> by talking, talking about, about death? About, talking yeah. About death. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and I also I, I uh, I'm fascinated in um, both of the genres that you're working at, at the distancing mechanisms, like how you approach these moments and use language to, in some ways, prepare the reader and other times confront the reader. And I'd love um, you, Natasha, to talk about the moment in Memorial Drive where you switch into the second person, mm-hmm. and and what made you make that decision. Yes. Yeah, so you know the the. Because the process of writing it, as we've been saying, it it is, even though there is this story, this thing I'm trying to get at, the whole thing is about language. It is about making, uh, in language, this thing. Uh, It's an ordering thing for me, as I've said. The chapter that you're asking about um, is a chapter called You Know. And, uh, in it, I, uh, I stop writing in the first person. And, uh, the first line of that chapter is, um, you remember even though you don't want to. And so the whole thing, uh, is written that way. And it, it finally, uh, culminates in a moment in which I say, you know, you know, you know, look at you. Even now, you think you can distance yourself from that girl you were, right in the second person, as if you weren't the one to whom any of this happened. It was such a thrill 
to figure out how in language, just by simply switching into the second person, that chapter could enact the feeling of being divided, the feeling of the kind of psychological traumatic thing that could divide the self, that could erode the self, if you cannot find a way to hold the self together. And so in the next chapter, um, I have to, it's called Dear Diary, and it is a chapter about writing. My mother gives me a diary so that I can contend with the thing that she now knows I know about the difficulty in her life, the domestic violence. But because I had written in the second person, I didn't know how I was going to get out of it. How do I go back to using the first person without showing how the self can be then uh, brought back together, composed? One composes in writing, one composes the self. And so I, I begin with this, you know, sort of an idiom about, uh, being beside oneself, you know, that when, you know, when something is, you know, so terrible or astonishing or something, we are rendered beside oneself. So how could those, the two selves that are beside be, come back together? And it's in the act of writing in that diary that I begin to compose myself. Oh, it's extraordinary. It's an extraordinary moment in the book. Um, uh, really amazingly done. Um, and it, it takes me to another distancing mechanism that Haney talked about a lot, actually. He loved to quote the story, um, Borges and I, about the Argentinian writer who has this whole story where he separates uh, the writer from the man and has this whole sort of way of talking about how Borges does this and I do that. And, um, and Heaney loved that story. And he says, I dwell in this house in Dublin and in the city. And Heaney lives in the country and in his memory. <laughs> and I wonder if, um, if you're seeing that kind of, that kind of split in, uh, in, in looking at his work. You know, I'm, I'm absolutely fascinated by what Natasha has just been talking about because if you stand back from it, you know, as you were saying, the divided self is, is very close to the collapse of the self, you know, and the, 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 um, it's the source of terror, really, isn't it? But also, if you don't have the divided self, you can't write, you know, that, that actually, you talk beautifully about the, the reintegration of the personality through, through, through writing. But a lot of in Heaney, it's actually, it's, always the doubleness that he's trying to create you know he's when he's writing he's 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 so often these two people you know um and so almost like somebody who has quite an integrated personality has to divide it um i don't know it was thinking about richard Elman, you know and Elman's great book about joyce and carl jung the psychoanalyst said about uh Joyce, he had to read some of Finnegan's Wake because he was treating Joyce's daughter. And he said about Joyce, he said, this, this man has induced in himself the symptoms of schizophrenia without actually having the disease. And, you know, there, there's something fascinating about that, that, that something about the writing. Now, Joyce, well, Finnegan's Wake is a pretty extreme example, but, you, you know, that the writing process, um, why is it so magnetic? It's so magnetic because of this doubleness. You know, it's the doubleness that opens up these spaces that, that in, in which the magic happens and the, the transformative power, the energy is there. But at the same time, if you push that too far or if that's where you're coming from, that, that, that divide is also what can make it impossible to be a person, to, to write and to, to function. So, you know, I'm not a, um, fond of this sort of romantic theory stuff about the closeness of creativity to madness, but there is, there is some common ground, I think, in, uh, I, I'd love to know what, you know, what you were saying about this, because you were talking about the writing as almost integrating your personality and bringing it back together again. But in the process of writing the memoir, you, you also have to be the two people, don't you? So you, you have to go back to, yourself as you were and now you're yourself as you are and I just wonder how you negotiate that 
You know, there's a, there's also a, a scene pretty early on, um, that, I, that, um, sort of leads to, uh, that scene of sort of, of being divided like that. And it is, um, when I first had this recollection of, uh, going back to, uh, going to my mother's apartment, uh, the morning after her death. And when I arrived, there are, uh, news people there a, a van and uh, a reporter and a, and a camera and they videotape um, me walking up to the apartment and going through the crime tape and stepping in and later on that night in a hotel I see the footage of myself walking into that room and one of the things that you know I say in this in the beginning of the memoir is you know, the, the person who went into that apartment is not the same one that came out, you know, and that it's as if she's still there, locked in the footage where it ends. Um, so yes, there is that kind of, of, of two-ness of being able to step outside oneself and to observe, uh, in the, in the, in the way that that, I think, creates a kind of metaphor. This is not sort of, you know, foreign, you know, for me thinking about, you know, you know, sort of, uh, what it means to be black in America, you know, when Du Bois, you know, reminds us that there is a kind of a double consciousness. There's also that sort of double consciousness, I think, for women who are also always seeing the self through the lens of someone else until we can subvert that gaze and look outward and not always you know, at the self from someone else. So yes, there is both the, the need to be able to step aside and look at that and to, uh, reanimate it. But also, I think that for people who somehow can't find the place where those two selves meet, that divide can destroy you. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Um, well, speaking of another way of, being outside yourself and watching yourself, you've uh, told us that they're um, l making a pilot for uh, Memorial Drive, and I wonder if you could tell us a little bit more about that. Well, so we shall see. Um, <laughs> I am a co-writer on um, the the what is you know uh, they hope will be a limited series of Memorial Drive, and so we've just finished writing the the script for the pilot. Mm -hmm. Um, it's been a, you know, a, a heady learning curve because I've never done that kind of writing and trying to, um, you know, think about telling the story with different storylines in a visual medium. Um, but I've, I, you know, I've enjoyed it, but I, I'm a little nervous about it too, you know, because, um, it's not fiction. You know, I'm, I, I once talked to Walter Mosley about, uh, when he let go of, uh, the novel Devil in a Blue Dress. And he talked about, you know, once you do, you just sort of turn it over and it becomes something entirely different with what they do with it. Um, but this is my life we're talking about, um, from the writing of it, uh, in my own memoir. And I think that the, the closest way to have some control over what story gets told is to be one of the writers also in the next medium of it. But this is a thing, you know, that I keep trying to do, uh, in so many ways. Um, and I think about this when I think about the biographer. Um, you know, my archive is here. And so people can go into it and they can find things and they can begin to write the story of Natasha Trethewey's life. Natasha Trethewey has written the story of Natasha Trethewey's life in Memorial Drive, and then again in the House of Being, and in all of the books of poems, and in the next book about my father. Um, so this actually brings me to the question that I wanted to ask Fenton. Okay, so this is what I was thinking about yesterday, listening to you talk about the dilemma. Um, the so T.S. Eliot wrote that he thought that the closest we get to pure literary criticism is artists writing about their own art, which is kind of what the House of Being was. And so 
But what I'm wondering then, when you have someone like me, you know, who's constantly doing these kinds of things, um, and lots of writers have, you know, uh, faced the task of trying to write why I write, and that's only the third time I've done it. The, the fourth will be the book about my father. Um, and they're all sort of different. But my question is, what is the synergy then, if you sort of apply that idea to the closest thing we get to pure criticism is the artist writing about their own art, what is the synergy between or the contentions between um, a memoirist, poet, and her perhaps would-be biographer? Um, so the biographer, I think... Um, uh, one of the jobs of the biographer is 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 not to repeat simply what the artist has said about herself or himself. You know, so um, you mean not to trust it, not to trust <laughs> it. I mean, to, well, to 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 apply. I mean, um, so you know, the the thing I always use as a in my own head for my journalism for everything, everything I write. You know, is 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 to remember the difference between cynicism and skepticism. Cynicism. I, I hate cynical biography. I I, I really don't like the idea that the job of the biographer is to take the writer down a peg or two. It's just not of any interest and, and it's actually, I think, negative and, 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 and destructive. But I think um, professional skepticism is required because I'm not saying you're like this, but uh, <laughs> artists are self-mythologizers oh, as well, yes. you know, <laughs> and, <Absolutely>. and, um, <laughs> and, and, and of course, uh, it's always utterly fascinating to read great writers describing themselves, but you know, it, very often when they're doing that, they're they're constructing parts of their own myth, you know. Um, and uh, and and he needs to take the case in point, you know, is 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 not immune to that. And and I, I, by the way, I'm, I'm not saying this at all. Critically, I, I think, how else are you going to live as a writer? Uh, you know, uh, you have to construct some kind of version of yourself, almost an avatar, you know. Well, you don't, I think, because you, you write very differently. But there, there's, you know, there, I think that avatar is Seamus Heaney. There is a Seamus Heaney, you know, who's out there as a public figure um, and, and, and is curating a, a notion of himself. So everything he writes about how he writes, you know, is, is, is formed by that. Part of my job is is not to sort of you know throw cold water on that. It's simply to look at what are the tensions, what are the things he doesn't say. Uh, one of the really striking things about Heaney's letters, for example, is that he actually doesn't tell you very much about writing. Mm -hmm. You know, he's there are far more passages in his letters about how I didn't write anything today. <laughs> I'm not writing. I'm not doing anything. I'm really lazy, which of course he's not. But there's a, an awful lot more of that than there is. Oh God, I had a wonderful idea for a poem today. This is what I did. It, it doesn't. It doesn't happen. Um, and so when he does write about how he writes, it's it it feels like it's this, it's it's this doubleness coming in again. It's a, it's it's another voice. He's almost treating himself as if he were writing about Yeats or about Hopkins or about some you know. Uh, and part of the fun of it then is to just look at, okay, well yeah, he didn't say anything about that. And of course, what you can do as well with with archives is you can you can look at the labor of the construction of a poem and you know don't need to say this to you but if you look at Seamus Heaney's manuscripts I mean very often all that survives from the beginning of, of the process to the end of a process is a two-word phrase mm -hmm. and it might be you know a, a, a six stanza poem you know, the labor, the labor, the work, the work, the work. And the work is not romantic. You know, the work, the work is, is, is just graft. sheer hard graft. Uh, and I think there's something in the way of, well, certainly with Heaney, a poet writes about themselves is they don't want to give away that craft. You know, they don't, they don't want that. How do, do you do that in your own, in your own letters? So if somebody goes to the archive here, will they, will they find your, blood, sweat, and tears, as well as your inspiration there? Well, you know, I, uh, so I'm thinking about um, mythologizing and curating, as you just said. And, you know, I know those of you who uh, listened to the House of Being the other day, one of the things that I'm talking about was very much the need to tell my own story because otherwise it would be written for me. 
there's a part that I didn't, you know, uh, read in the lecture that's in the book that is about, you know, the, the first page of, uh, the narrative of one's life. And I locate that on the birth certificate where race of mother colored, race of father Canadian is written. That's already starting to say something and not something else for particular reasons in that historical moment when my parents' interracial marriage was illegal. Yeah. Perhaps that's the reason. So for me, it has always been about trying to control the narrative. I know very much that that is a thing that I'm interested in. So for example, and this also goes back to the question about uh, writing the pilot, the I love people's stories. Jer Jericho and I were just talking about sort of the night before or the, the days leading up to him winning the Pulitzer and what was going on in his head. Um, I remember very well the night before, um, my husband was on a research trip and I was going to meet him the next day because I had a reading. I had to fly somewhere for a reading. So I'm at home by myself and all of my journals that I had written drafts, you know, poems in all throughout graduate school, um, just the whole sh shelf of, of, of journals. And I started taking them off the shelf and reading and looking at all these drafts of my poems and feeling very nostalgic about my young self who was, you know, s struggling to try to write a decent poem. And on the next page, there would be numbers, figures, where I had started with my TA salary, and then I would deduct my rent, and then I would deduct, you know, utilities, and then I would deduct what might be groceries, and there would be a grocery list. Um, and I started tearing those pages out one by one. And when I told this to my husband, he's a historian. Yeah. <laughs> He was like, you did what? Because, <laughs> of course, the historian, the biographer, this is what they want to see. They want to see, and I understand it, why, while writing that particular poem, she was also thinking yeah. about this. So I told this to my co-writer, and she loved that, and she wanted to have this scene. And I said, well, wait a minute, because the problem with that is that if you just show that, what it's going to look like is the cliché narrative of the struggling artist trying to figure out how she's going to pay her bills. I said, what it's not going to show is that I would get out the Stop and Shop flyer because they used to have whole tenderloin of beef um, on sale, and I would go to the butcher, buy an entire tenderloin of beef, have him cut it into steaks, and at night I would have dinner, a filet mignon, a glass of wine, <laughs> candlelight, by myself, and I would think and I would write poems. That's a different narrative. So if we're going to show me doing all these numbers, we got to show what I was doing it for. Yeah. Right. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah, nobody's going to look at those numbers and think, this is so she can buy filet mignon. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so. Um, I think it's fascinating also to see the ways in which the construction of the writer is also about the resistance to the biographer and to the interpreter. Yes. And Heaney was very um, uh, uh, common in that respect. He was very reluctant um, to, he, he wrote this amazing book called Stepping Stones, which was a series of interviews with uh, the poet and writer Dennis O'Driscoll. And it was published in 2008. And he and Dennis would exchange long emails and questions and answers, but they were all written. They weren't, they weren't done in person. And it's an extraordinary resource. But Heaney said about it, it was a way to keep the biographers at bay. <laughs> and then um, he also, in the new edition of the letters that Fenton's already referred to, he says, there are whole areas of one's life that one wants to keep free of the gaze of print. Not that there is anything to cover up, but that there is a sort of emotional robbery in the uncovering. So... I, I just wonder, Fenton, how you deal with those kinds of <laughs> you, you know, it's, um, I mean, one of the uh, things, uh, so I, I've been working on the Ine biography uh, for a long time. I was doing that in parallel with writing my own thing, you know. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, some elements of autobiography while doing biography. And that's kind of a very interesting thing because, of course, in your 
autobiographical writing, you're also mythologizing yourself, you know. So you're very aware of um, what do I want in, how do I want people to think about me? You know, this is, if, if anything is kind of going to survive, it's this, you know, big long book with bits of my own life in it. Um, and um, so I, I, I'm actually I was very sensitized to this, you know. Um, and for, for, for Seamus, I think uh, an awful lot of this was um, not even, as you said, there's no scandals. There's not, it's not about hiding stuff. It's just about he doesn't want certain places, certain people, fam- you know, to, 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 for it to happen to them. He, he doesn't want them to be mythologized because he's the one who can do the mythologizing, you know, you know, and, and again, I, I don't mean that in any kind of critical way. That's, 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 you know, why is somebody interested in Balahi? Balahi is a wonderful place, I'm sure, but the only reason is because he's worked over. I mean, it's, I, I don't know, it's, it's quite weird to go to Heaney country, as it's now called, because it feels like being, um, Gulliver in Lilliput, you know, because you, you've read the stuff. It's so imprinted on Western culture now, that place. And it's just like, you know, a few feels. I mean, it's really, there's nothing much, you know, it's not like epic landscape or, and it's just, he's worked over and over and over again, that territory. And he doesn't want people with their big hobnail boots kind of stamping all over it, you know? And it is something to do with, with, with all of this. And, I, I don't know. I, I became very conscious when I was trying to write my own stuff, uh, just how um, how delicate and fragile memory is, you know, mm-hmm. um, and also how false it is. So, uh, I, I mean, I had I, I had an idea in the book because uh, you know Muhammad Ali appears in the book <laughs> later on because he gets on my father's bus. My father was a bus conductor, you know. <laughs> Muhammad Ali gets on his bus and. This was the man he adored most in the entire world, you know, uh, and he gets on his bus. And I thought, I, I knew I was going to have that later. And I thought, actually, you, you, you know, what you want to do when you're writing a book is you want to plant things that will kind of come up again or whatever. And I, I had this absolutely vivid memory, which I've told people, you know, at dinner parties and everything else about the arrival of television in our house, you know, which was 1963, very late it comes to Ireland. And we got the television and running home from school, I was five, and the television is there, and the television is turned on. And on the television is Muhammad Ali, or Cassius Clay, as he was then called, who had just defeated Sonny Liston. And he's saying, I am the greatest. I ought to be the king of the world. Uh, this is television. Wow, you know. And, and, you know, and then I would always say, you know, and everything after that was always disappointing because television <laughs> couldn't live up to it. So I, I was, you know, I had all, all this, you know, that goes very nicely there. And then I found the um, receipt for my parents um, renting the TV. You know, then I rented in those days. Um, and it couldn't have happened. It just couldn't have happened. <laughs> you know, the dates just didn't, didn't go. Like, you know, I, I looked up the date. And I said, just, just to reassure myself, I look up the date of the Sonny Liston, Cassius Clay fight. And no, you know. <laughs> I mean, I may have seen something like that at some stage. I probably did because I do remember it. But it could not have happened like that. Wow. And I, I, did you, have you ever found that, that you, you, you remember things and then you find, no. You know, my father used to say, Tasha remembers everything, whether it happened or not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so, I loved Ali too, or Cassius oh, Clay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So anyway, you know, I, I think it's just this thing that, that, that you have to sort of respect that with, with, with Heaney, you know, and, and, or with anybody else while you're writing biography, which is to say, um, you know, you, he, he's, he's entitled to his self mythologization and the construction of himself. And, and I'm entitled just to say, yeah, but that didn't quite happen like that. Uh, or to say there are really interesting things that he just never, uh, writes about or refers to. So a, an example of this is, um, I don't know if anybody rem- you know, was lucky enough to be at his readings or whatever. You, you remember him as a performer, you know, he was, he was a magnetic presence in that sense. And, um, he has a few poems about acting and acting in Shakespeare in school and, and all stuff. But in Stepping Stones, this sort of semi-official kind of biography that done and through this question and answer, he talks about, um, what theatre would they have seen in this rural area? And he said, you know, it was terrible. It was nothing really. But you would have these Irish nationalist melodramas from the 19th century that would be played out. 
And the big figure in the sentimental Irish nationalist melodramas was Robert Emmett, who was the kind of nationalist martyr who was um, executed by the British in 1803. And loads of these terrible plays about Robert Emmett, right? And he says, oh, you know, you see these. And, and Dennis just says something like, and did you ever act? And he says, no. And he did. I mean, I, so <laughs> I, I, I found in, you know, this is where newspapers are really interesting. I mean, a, a review in the local newspaper of this production of a, you know, one of these horrible sentimental dramas, which is full of the wonder of this young student from, from Belfast, but come back to Balahi to play Robert Emmett <laughs> in the, in the play, right? Um, and it talks about his passion and the, you know, the charisma of this guy and how, and you would think, well, surely that's the thing you would want to remember. So, so what's interesting is why does he not want to remember it? You know, why does he not want people to associate that with him? Or why can't he remember it even? I, I have no doubt he remembered you it, you know. Like yeah, that. yeah. So I, I think it's very deliberate. I think, you know, I, I think it's very deliberately saying, because there, there is a poem that if you, if you read it very, very carefully, is clearly sort of has a bit of this in it, you know, but you have to know the thing that nobody knows in order for the poem to make any sense. So I think he remembered it, um, but did not want it to be part of his visual memory. And it's not a shameful thing. Like, it's not like some horrible secret. But you didn't see the performance. <laughs> no, well, this is true. But all we've got left, of course, you know, are, are the reviews. And the reviews are great. I mean, they're the local reviews, which always are very nice about everybody. But but it's just, mo you know what I mean? It's just moments like that where this is where biography, I think, does have a sort of validity, right? Which is to say... Um, you, you know, what's being forgotten, what's being left out, what's the elision between the experience of the person and the version of themselves that they construct both in their work and then in the way they talk and write about the work. Right. I think, I think this is exactly why I, I, I love, um, your subtitle again, just going back to personal and history together. Because, you know, again, I've also always been driven by, uh, the the desire to incorporate documentary evidence because i write about history i i want to use documentary evidence to help you know make my point you know even in a poem yeah. but you know so this is why in the memoir with what i i also sort of meditate on you know the flaws of memory um uh I have, I have a character in a, in a collection of poems that thinks about is always, I'm sort of always thinking about how flawed and changeable memory is. It's the exact reason that, uh, there is, there are chapters in Memorial Drive that are the documentary evidence from the court file, from the police report, yeah. from the autopsy, things like that. I, try to blend that documentary evidence with my recollection. Yeah. Uh, and sometimes, you know, more often than not, there are contradictions there. Yeah. Are. yeah. And and you also show that there are contradictions in documentary evidence. That, yes. You know, that it, it, they get it. The, the, they get their record wrong. can be wrong. Right. The, the, the I think the thing is, right. is that it's not, gotcha, I, I, I found you out. You were... Mm -hmm. You were said this thing and this is what really happens. It's not. That's just the nature of memory of the self right. of, you know, all these gaps between our public and private selves. It's, it is life. You know, yeah. there's nothing shameful or wrong about this. It's, it's, it's actually what makes it interesting as to how we live and how we remember and how we articulate ourselves. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm, I'm sorry to say we are coming to the end of our conversation, which has flown by, um, uh, for us. I hope so for you too. But I did ask, um, our, our guests to choose a poem to read to finish us off. Um, and, um, Natasha, would you mind beginning and then we'll all each read a poem? Sure. So you, you had asked me to read a specific poem. Did you? I did. I, well, I mean, well, well you can choose whatever you want. I did ask you a specific poem, but if you, if you one that you think would fit better. Um, well, no, why don't I just go ahead and read that one? Um, Geraldine actually asked me to read the, um, the very f uh, first poem in my new and selected. And, uh, it, it is, uh, uh it opens the book, uh, and the poem that I think sort of bookends it and closes the book, uh, they're, they're meant to be sort of read together. And I was working on, um, my new and selected at the same time that I was working on the memoir. And so it actually helped me 
to figure out how to um, construct the new and selected in what order um, the poems from all the previous books would be placed in here. But the framing of that was the most important thing. It, it, it was at a point in my life where I wanted to say again, if after, you know, all these books and that I've written, you still don't know why I write, well, here is another reason for it. And part of this has to do with, um, decades of, uh, the kinds of things that people say about victims of domestic violence that I've had to contend with again and again. The poem's called Imperatives for Carrying On in the Aftermath. Do not hang your head or clench your fists when even your friend, after hearing the story, says, my mother would never put up with that. Fight the urge to rattle off statistics that more often, a woman who chooses to leave is then murdered. The hundredth time your father says, but she hated violence, why would she marry a guy like that? Don't waste your breath explaining again how abusers wait, are patient, that they don't beat you on the first date, sometimes not even the first few years of a marriage. Keep an impassive face whenever you hear, stand by your man, and let go your rage when you recall those words or advice given your mother. Try to forget the first trial before she was dead, when the charge was only attempted murder. Don't belabor the thinking or the sentence that allowed her ex-husband's release a year later or the juror who said, it's a domestic issue. They should work it out themselves. Just breathe when, after you read your poems about grief, a woman asks, do you think your mother was weak for men? Learn to ignore subtext. Imagine a thought cloud above your head, dark and heavy, with the words you cannot say. Let silence reign down. Remember you were told by your famous professor that you should write about something else, unburden yourself of the death of your mother, and just pour your heart out in the poems. Ask yourself what's in your heart, that reliquary, blood locket, and seed bed, and contend with what it means, the folk saying you learned from a Korean poet in Seoul, that one does not bury the mother's body in the ground, but in the chest, or, like you, you carry her corpse on your back. Um, this is really terrible because I'm going to read um, Seamus Heaney poem. And uh, if he were here, he would read it himself. Um, and it's um, ventriloquizing Seamus is a, is a, is a mugs game. Um, but this is called In the Attic. And I, I, I thought it, I would read it because uh, it deals with memory and the slippages of memory um, so beautifully. Um, a couple of things just worth knowing about it. So uh, he wrote, of course, in the attic of of, of his house in um, in in uh, Sandy Mountain, Dublin, and it was quite one of those sort of old houses that had you know the the normal floors, and then there was this little door, and then this very very steep narrow stairs that went up to the attic, and so this obviously triggers the idea of the the crow's nest, you know, the the cabin boy having to climb up into the crow's nest, um, and it's it's written after his stroke. So words are beginning to, are becoming a little bit problematic. And then he remembers his grandfather, um, when Seamus has been to see the movie of Treasure Island, um, cause, calling Israel Hans, who's the kind of evil figure in Treasure Island, Isaac Hans, and <laughs> the slippage of memory. So that's really all you need to know. Uh, so it's in, it's in four parts. Like Jack Hawkins aloft in the cross trees of Hispaniola, nothing underneath him but still green water 
and clean bottom sand, the ship aground, the canted mast, far out above a sea floor where striped fish pass in shoals, and then they've passed the face of Israel hands that rose in the shrouds before Jim shot him dead, appears to rise again. But he was dead enough, the story says, being both shot and drowned. 2. A birch tree planted twenty years ago comes between the Irish sea and me at the attic skylight, a man marooned in his own loft, a boy ship-shaped in the crow's nest of a life, airbrushed to and fro, wind-drunk, braced by all that's thrumming up from keel to masthead, rubbing his eyes to believe them, and this most buoyant, billowy, topgallant birch. 3. Ghost-footing what was then the terra firma of hallway linoleum, Grandfather now appears, his voice a waver like the draft-prone screen they'd set up in the club rooms earlier for the matinee I've just come back from. And Isaac Hans, he asks, was Isaac in it? His memory of the name a waver too, his mistake perpetual, once and for all, like the single splash when Israel's body fell. 4. As I age and blank on names, as my uncertainty on stairs is more and more the light-headedness of a cabin boy's first time on the rigging, as the memorable bottoms out into the irretrievable, it's not that I can't imagine still that slight of untoward rupture and world tilt as a wind freshened and the anchor weighed. Thank you so much to our amazing um, um, guests this evening and for the uh, wonderful conversation that has just grown um, so beautifully out of the lectures for the last two days. It's been my enormous pleasure um, to uh, to be the host of the Elman Lectures with Carla uh, for this series and to have such extraordinary speakers. Um, thank you all for coming out and um, enjoying them with us. Um, so thanks again and um, enjoy your evening and please also so visit the exhibition in the gallery upstairs. Uh, listen now again. Carla. I don't know if it's appropriate. Let's give our guests, Vinton O'Toole, Natasha Trethaway, Geraldine Higgins, last round of applause. I have a final question. Just a few announcements. One question for Fenton. Would it be appropriate to say... We don't know ourselves. We're so thrilled with the Elman Lectures. <laughs> um, including, um, in concluding the 2024 Elman Lectures, first I want to say thank you to all of you for being such an excellent audience and to remind you, as Geraldine just did, that you may buy your books and have them signed by Natasha Trethaway and Fintan O'Toole just outside the um, performance hall. I want to thank again President Greg Fenves for his enthusiastic support this year for the Elman Lectures. Vice Provost Valida Dent, Dean Barbara Krauthammer, the Hightower Fund, my heartiest shout out to Jennifer Gunter King, who has been a tremendous partner along with Geraldine Higgins in launch, relaunching the Elman Lectures. I want to thank the li all of the staff in the libraries, the Fox Center, the Schwartz Center, Advancement Alumni Engagement, University Communications, all of whom have arranged receptions and radio interviews, beautiful graphics, signs, Instagram posts, golf carts, flights, book orders, and QR codes to relaunch this important tradition. And speaking of QR codes, I want to draw your attention to these. They're located on the book tables outside, and I really beg you to use them. Or visit the Elman Lectures website or the Fox Center website, where you will find an easy tab to make contributions. 
in a time when support for the humanities and the arts is waning in much of the country and opportunities to learn from brilliant poets and writers is very much not guaranteed, I ask you to consider making a contribution of any size. We are extremely proud to make the Elman Lectures free and open to the public. In fact, we hope next time to live stream these in the future so that an even larger audience, national and international alike, will experience the beauty of the Elman Lectures. But meanwhile, please help us ensure that this important tradition continues long into the future. So thank you for joining us, and I wish you a great evening. <laughs>